Howdy. Howdy. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Biological and Agricultural Engineering Centennial Seminar Series. Uh, we're honored today to have the second of these uh, in our series sponsored by Cotton Foundation. Uh, we want to thank once again the Cotton Foundation for their support of this seminar series and this lecture. The intent of the series that we're having here this spring semester is to highlight some of the past activities of our faculty and students. Uh, and we're very pleased today to have a Dr. Otto Kunze, who qualifies on both counts. One of our, our graduates and a longtime faculty member. We have a, uh, a collection of Kunze engineers with us here today. Uh, in addition to Otto, the uh, agricultural engineering graduate, class of 50, uh, we also have his daughter, Karen, who's an industrial engineering graduate, class of 88. Thank you for being with us. Uh, and Glenn, a civil engineer, class of 75. Well done, Otto. Um, I, as I said, I'm very pleased and honored to have the opportunity to introduce to you Otto Kunze. Uh, I mean, many of you probably doesn't need a lot of introduction. Otto is a part of what has been described as our greatest generation. That portion of our citizens that defended this nation and the rest of uh, the world in World War II. Uh, you'll hear a little bit about that. After his service in Europe, he came back and was one of the large cohort of veterans who came to Texas A&M uh, following the war. Completed the studies. Uh, he, uh, I, I should have mentioned, I skipped over here. World War II uh, served, and, and you'll hear a little bit about that, but he was awarded two bronze stars for his service there. He worked in electrification, experienced rural electrification uh, as a part of his youth and, uh, and growing up. Uh, and then he moved into the area as a faculty member here of post-harvest processing. Uh, and so he'll be today talking about both of those activities and highlighting a part of what was done by this particular department as well as his own individual experiences. Otto retired from our faculty in 1990 uh, and lives now on the Bakunzi farmstead back in Warda, Texas. So with that, Otto, welcome back to Scopes Hall and thank you for being willing to make this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Searcy. Uh, I guess it's been 25 years since I lectured in here last, so uh, we'll get going and see how fast we can move here. I was born in Warda, and that's some 70 miles southwest of here. I graduated from the Grange High School, and uh, I guess while I was in high school, I was the editor of a little newspaper that we called the High Standard. That's rather insignificant, but I was able to list that on my resume, and uh, uh, it sort of surprised me what the consequences or what the results were. While I was in high school, I was an FFA member and I got on a judging team, soil conservation team, and uh, went down to Kingsville where we uh, had a regional meeting, and I guess must have done all right there because they sent us on to state. 
and gee whiz, I got to this strange place, and they set us down in a big room, and I looked up there, and there was a chandelier, and I believe I had all the tools or uh, plows and hair teeth that you see up there right now. So, uh, and up on the wall here were murals that, uh, uh, well, as the first tractor I saw was rubber tires. I hadn't seen one. Back home, we had everything on steel wheels. When they built Highway 77, they put in a concrete slab so my dad could drive across the road without having to put down boards. So, uh, uh, <coughs> the, I guess the first uh, rural electrification line uh, that was built in Texas was up in Bartlett, where they got power in 1935. Fade County got power in 37 and 38, and they came out to Warda, where I lived in about 39. So the year I started high school, why we got electric power out on the farm. Uh, the department here was actively involved in that rural electrification, but uh, uh, out there we were not familiar with ag engineering, and really the first time that I uh, visited the department was when I was on that uh, soil conservation team. Uh, you can see that uh, the appointments that were made in 19 23 by President Bazell, and in 1926, I guess, Texas A&M received a $1,000 grant to uh, study rural electrification. Here you see the department head, Dan Scotes. Uh, I never met Dan, but uh, the building is named after him, and he is the name floated around here when I first came, and uh, this is T.O. Walton. He had a son who was a medical doctor here in town for many years. We used him as our family doctor. Uh, he was involved in the uh, electrification procedure the, before or uh, getting power to the Texas farms. Uh, out on the farm, we didn't know a whole lot about electricity. Uh, uh, I guess the first electricity that we had there was possibly in the church we had out there. We didn't have electric power yet, but the people were talking electricity, so by golly, they uh, bought a generator and a little one-lunger uh, gasoline engine uh, drove the generator with a flat belt, and uh, it must have been about 30 or 40 cycles because the lights were continuously blinking. They'd go out, and they'd go on, they'd go out, and they'd go on about 30 times per second. And that little engine had a hard time uh, pulling that generator at that speed, so the minister went out and but uh, I saw the thing boiling, you know, before the sermon. He was going to put some water into that engine, and he got some on the flat belt, and it came off of the pulleys, so the congregation was in the dark. So uh, that's quite an improvement here. Uh, you can see here the uh, way that the department responded to the needs of the citizens out there in the state. I did not see this truck, but uh, uh, the washing machine with the ringer, that's very familiar with me. Uh, the hot water heater, of course, we've got today, and the light bulb we've got today. Uh, we didn't have the Romex cable when electricity came to the farm, so they ran 
single wires, got to a, a ceiling joist. They drilled a hole through it and put a knob, a porcelain knob through it that they could pull that wire through. And they had three wires running uh, across the ceiling going to a light or just two if it was 120. If it was 220, we had three wires. That, that's, those were the first uh, lighting a wiring job that we had. I remember when they wired our home, uh, it, uh, I believe it cost all of $300. And uh, uh, the, uh, well, uh, we had uh, four outlets or two duplex outlets put in the kitchen, two in the dining room, and uh, didn't have use for any of them because we didn't have them to plug in. <laughs> and uh, in the kitchen, we put it on the farthest wall because we wanted it to be out of the way. <laughs> uh, in the dining room, we put it next to uh, what we, next to the ice box before we we had an Electrolux, which was a kerosene-fired uh, refrigerator. It took five gallons of kerosene uh, per week. Uh, before that, we had a, a milk truck bring us 100 pounds of ice twice a week. And before that, we had an evaporative cooler, which was uh, absolutely useless because it just, just wouldn't do the cooling. Uh, on this slide, you can see a, a grain mill a crusher there, and I guess uh, over here it's an insulage cutter that would elevate the stuff up to a, a vertical silo. There used to be one in the displays here, and it might still be back in the Back, uh, it's, uh, I, I can't see it from here. But those were uh, some of the things that were changed to electricity as they began to use electric power. <clears throat> At our farm out in Fayette County, why that power came the year I started high school. My grandpa was still alive when it came there. He said, well, gee whiz, I hope I can live a couple more years just to enjoy this light. And uh, what he had was a little wall light and uh, probably had a pull chain on it that he could pull and that light would come off and he'd pull it again, it'd go, it'd go on and then pull it again, it'd go off. So he really enjoyed and appreciated that light. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the construction, uh, well, they laid out the lines, they delivered the poles, and they didn't have post hole diggers or hole diggers like they got today. They had a uh, shovel with a, uh, uh, first of all, a uh, sharp end, I guess, where they could get down into the hole and uh, just try to loosen a little bit of that dirt. And then they had a flat bottom shovel that they could turn and get a little bit of the dirt on top of that shovel, have to lift it out and dump it. Repeat that. Uh, if a fellow dug two or three holes a day, he was working pretty hard. Uh, they delivered the poles, and I had a brother. Uh, they were creosoted. We were, I guess, barefooted. And he, he, he thought, well, you know, you, you could take the sobriety test on this pole. He decided he could walk on, see if he could walk on the pole. Well, he didn't pass the test. He stepped on the side of that pole and rubbed a little bit of that creosote on his ankle. And, leg and 
uh, didn't know what creosote was, but he found out, he learned a lot, that creosote uh, was just as bad as electricity as far as getting it on yourself. It blistered them pretty well. All right, I uh, went to school out in the country. We had a public school, then I went to high school in LaGrange, a town some 12 miles from where I lived. They were building Highway 77 at that time, so we had to detour. And uh, in my senior year, I turned 18 on May the 27th, and on May the 28th, I graduated, and World War II was in full swing, so I really didn't have to look for a job. I knew what it was. Uh, I got uh, into the Army, and uh, they sent me off to the Signal Corps. I trained in the Signal Corps for 12 weeks, six weeks of basic training, and six weeks of pole climbing and uh, typing on the typewriter, and about that time the bulge occurred. That's, I guess, Hitler's last effort to uh, try to uh, win the war or break the Allied armies up. We lost a lot of people at that time, and uh, they suddenly decided we didn't need any more signal corps men. They, gathered us up and shipped us to Camp Harris here in Texas and uh, gave me six weeks of uh, infantry training and that's all we needed. We were qualified infantrymen ready to go overseas. So we left the States on February the 10th and landed in Scotland took a train across England, took a little uh, victory ship across the canal one night. I guess it was in a convoy we couldn't see. Got over to France and then rode 40 and 8 railway cars on up to the Luxembourg border, Metz, France. And uh, uh, that 40 and 8 car, I guess, got its name back in World War I, where that car was good for uh, 40 men or 8 mules, so uh, 40 and 8 cars. Uh, I walked into the lines from Luxembourg and then was with the division all the way across Germany, ending up in uh, Chemnitz, which is on the Czech border. Uh, after the war, I was one of the soldiers who had the fewest points, so I got to stay a while longer and uh, really uh, a lot of the people that had served or were in the service before I got in, they got to go home before I did. And uh, uh, I got home then in June of 46, and in September, I wanted to go to a and Well, a and had about 5,500 students, and there were 6,000 registered for the all semester, there was no way to get into a and so they put us out on the Riverside campus. Barracks 213 with about 24 men per barracks. Uh, we had uh, uh, a chemistry prof here. Uh, and I thought I had his name here. Uh, he was in charge out at Tom Harrington. He was in charge out there. There was nothing particularly uh, notable about him, but he did become the chancellor of a and some years later. Another thing that I remember about Tom was that 
he visited with every veteran that was out there. He uh, invited him to come to his office and uh, got to know us all. So uh, another fellow out there was Roy Buchik. He was Dean of Men. Well, uh, I think he probably got a Purple Heart during the war, but uh, uh, the significant thing about Roy was he was on the 1939 football team. So uh, we got to know him. <clears throat> uh, during the summer, I moved on campus, and I got a letter from Roland Bing. He was head of student publications. And he says, Otto, you, I see you worked on a newspaper in high school. How would you like to work on the battalion? Well, I worked on the high standard, and uh, worked on the battalion sounded pretty good. I thought I would. We had four colleges, the College of Veterinary Medicine, that was agriculture. Of course, the College of Agriculture was agriculture. And this was ag engineering, so I felt like I was an engineer. I could cover three colleges, and the rest of the staff could cover arts and sciences, which was the other college. So I had a great time covering <laughs> stories in all of these uh, departments. Uh, I guess one of the interesting things was that in about 1947, uh, the Ag Engineering Department decided that, hey, we ought to, we want to be professional engineers, or we want to be eligible to be professional engineers. Well, to be a professional engineer, you had to come through an engineering curriculum, so we got into joint administration. The College of Agriculture would handle most of our routine activities, but the College of Engineering had to approve our curriculum. So we got to attend all of the dean's meetings uh, in the College of Agriculture and in the College of Engineering. And uh, well, for a while, uh, I sort of felt like, you know, we just, we are new, we're the new kid on the block. Uh, we, we're just not quite up to snuff. Uh, but uh, working on the battalion, uh, the mechanical engineers were going to have their student banquet tonight. I don't, why don't you cover that? So I'd go and cover that. And of course, this was also the case with other departments. And the next day, there'd be a story in the battalion about their banquet. Well, every prof over in mechanical engineering thought I was their student. And uh, uh, they all uh, embraced me after that. Well, Torbeta Pi, that's the engineering society uh, for students. Uh, they knew I was working on the battalion. I got elected to that, and they let me be their reporter. So uh, I think uh, uh, I enjoyed and I think the department enjoyed the fact that it helped to make us engineers. And uh, since we could help them get into the battalion, uh, they loved that. So I worked on the battalion for uh, three years. Uh, and got to finally be managing editor, which uh, that uh, I would receive the stories as they came in. And uh, really, uh, it was something that I had never planned on, but uh, it was just real uh, uh, close or uh, just a little bit more nudging and I'd become an ag writer like uh, uh, Charlie Ball was an ag engineer, wrote all his life. Ed Wilburn was an ag engineer, wrote all his life. And we had a bunch of people that wrote in magazines and 
And old Fred Jones, our department head, why, he uh, loved to have ag engineers working for the magazine. So, uh, here you see a, a picture of, uh, since I was working on the battalion, I got to be the reporter for the student branch. <laughs> And uh, that's Charlie Modisett and Mark Garden there. Charlie, I believe, was our president. Mark was our uh, secretary. And uh, that's Fred Jones right there. He was our de department head. Charlie was the class president. And those are two representatives from, I think, International Harvester that were giving the program that night. Uh, I graduated from A and M and uh, went on to Ames, Iowa, and got my master's. And uh, before I got through with my master's, well, Sutter Pine and Lake Company got in touch with me, say, "Hey, we'd like for you to uh, come work for us in the Ura Grande Valley." And uh, I guess they even contacted me when I got my a BS degree. I said, no, I'm going to get a master's degree, so I'm not, I'm not interested right now. Well, they were back, and I believe uh, after I got my master's degree uh, that same year, uh, the Ag, National Ag Engineering Society had their national meeting in the Rice Hotel down in Houston, and uh, my prospective wife and I, we made that meeting, and I remember that we had an aerial demonstration of fertilizing a rice field. So, uh, uh, the CPNL H. O. Roberts was their employee, who was an ag engineer, graduated some years previous. He interviewed me there and uh, got me to take the job. And uh, in August of that year, well, I went to work for Central Power and Light Company down in San Benito. That's about eight or 10 miles from the Mexican border. Well, uh, there was a fellow by the name of Bob Dutton who was the commercial manager for the company. Uh, Otto was on the job down in the valley. They picked up another new employee or potential employee and came down to the valley and the first day we were going to run a pump test. My job was to convert uh, farm belt driven pumps on the Rio Grande Valley, on the Rio Grande River, get them converted to electricity. So. Uh, Harlingen, a company down there, they had a, a Sheldon pump company that uh, I don't know how professional they were, but for a low lift pump, they could take a 12 inch pipe, put an impeller on the bottom of it, put a pulley on top up here, and now you get your farm tractor and a flat built, and you can pump water with that. Well. Uh, the efficiency was very low, and uh, Central Power and Light Company thought, you know, we can get all of those farm tractors off of the Rio Grande if we get a man that can uh, figure out uh, what pump size they need, how fast that pump has to be driven, and get them converted to electricity. That was my job. Well. Uh, we were going to test a Sheldon pump that first day. They had a weir, rectangular with the uh, opening, and uh, I'd never set a weir before, and I don't think that uh, the new employee, other new employee, had ever set a weir. So we tried to set that weir, and it washed out on us about twice. And the commercial manager said, well, I'm going to get you fellas 
a hamburger, <laughs> you all drop your pants and you get in there and sit that weird. <laughs> so we did. Well, I had grown up with a trench silo where we dipped the water every evening out of that silo because it always rained like it did this year. And that water was pretty potent. Uh, it smelled. Uh, that uh, Setting that weir in that mud wasn't so bad, but that other employee, he leaned on his shovel and said, you know, I wonder, I wonder, I really wonder whether I went to school for this. <laughs> and that's the last time I ever saw him. He, he disappeared. Well, uh, I, I enjoyed the job. Uh, CPNL, Central Power and Light Company, had its headquarters in Corpus Christi. And uh, I guess served up to Victoria. And CPNL served South Texas. Uh, CPNL had South Texas, and it was up to CPNL to make that part of Texas prosper. That's why they hired me. And uh, if the farmers, producers didn't prosper, the company didn't prosper. The farmer could pick up and move away, but CPNL had that part of Texas to serve. It was up to them to make the people in that area prosper, because as the people prospered, so did the company. So uh, CPNL was uh, uh, trying to get its people to prosper, and that work on back to the employees too. Keep the employees trained, give them what's necessary to serve the people. So uh, I did a lot of air conditioning work. Uh, I, in my master's degree, I minored in uh, air conditioning and refrigeration. But uh, my primary job was to convert river pumps driven by farm tractors with a flat belt to uh, electric motors. Uh, while I was down there, why uh, the pink old worm was quite bad, and uh, I guess the utility companies were working with Pete Monfort here, who uh, headed up a uh, electrification program all over the state, plus Louisiana and surrounding states. And uh, uh, he would teach short courses, and then he'd find or have problems that the electric companies would come up with, and they'd uh, work with Pete in trying to solve those problems. Well, the pink bollworm was very active in the valley. How do you tell how bad it's going to be this year? They came up with the idea that they could put out black light traps, and uh, if they could catch the pink bollworm moth, they could possibly predict how bad that worm's going to be and uh, maybe do something to eliminate or ameliorate the uh, possibility of the damage that it might do. So uh, they're going to put up pink bollworm moth traps. Well, uh, to do that, uh, that trap used a black light, it used a time clock. Uh, I don't hear the man that's supposed to set the traps up and uh, time clocks keep them on time and we'll get an entomologist perhaps from the Wesley Coast Station to uh, collect the moths. You don't have to worry about that. So we set up four or five of those moth traps uh, throughout the valley and uh, uh, Pete says, uh, get, get some pictures of that. So I got myself a photographer, and 
Uh, they had cyanide jars at the bottom of the trap where the uh, bugs would fly against the uh, vertical uh, sheet and they'd drop into a funnel and into the jar and before it decided to get out why well, it'd have enough of that cyanide gas to kill it. And uh, we were taking pictures and I was turning a one of the pictures was of myself putting a cyanide jar on one of those traps. And we sent the pictures to Carpus, and they, of course, sent them to Pete. And the time passed, and uh, uh, about six or eight months later, why, here was a private utility employee uh, putting a cyanide jar on a bug trap on the cover of a rural REA magazine. Uh, that, that really rocked the rafters for a while. How in the world did that happen? Well, it turned out that, uh, I guess, ARS in Washington had written to Pete, uh, Pete, what's going on? And Pete gathered up a bunch of pictures, sent them to Washington, and uh, showed them what was going on in Texas. And, REA, Rural Electrification Administration, then came along and uh, asked uh, ARS uh, what's going on, and they gathered a picture, sent them to ARS, Agricultural Research Service, and they went through the picture, and here's one with somebody screwing a quart jar, cyanide jar, in a bug trap. So they put it on their front page and on their cover. And uh, that's how a, a private utility company employee got on the cover page of the REA magazine. Well, we all lived it down, so uh, we did all right. And it was quite interesting to work with those big bowworm traps. Uh, Besides pumping water out of the river, a lot of the Rio Grande Valley has a water table five or six in, uh, feet below the ground. Uh, the years that I was down there were very dry, so the thing to do was to uh, put a series of uh, sand points down in line, connect them all together out in one direction, do the same out in the other direction, take a manifold, connect them all together, and put, that, put them all on one pump. Well, uh, they could pump water that way. Just everybody likes to get more water than what they have, so they'd run that pump twice as fast as uh, needed to get the water that they could, and they'd complain about high pump water pumping bills. Well, just just eating them up. Well, the, the little seepage wells couldn't produce the water, water that the pump could pump. They were running the pump too, too fast. They were cavitating the impellers. And uh, so what we had to do is get a vacuum gauge, install it at the suction side of the pump, and we'd go down there and we'd uh, slow that pump down, slow it down, slow it down. I could show the owner how the amps were dropping, but the water was staying the same. So finally, when the vacuum started dropping, well, that's the uh, uh, speed at which you could run the pump. We'd have to work with the hardware stores or the people that would supply the V-belts and the V-pulleys. Uh, Charlie Ball heard about that, and uh, he says, hey, I hear you're pumping water out of uh, seepage wells down there. Write me a story about that. So I got together with the local manager in Harlingen, and we went out there and got three farmers, took pictures of them, sent them to Charlie, and uh, some month later, here comes the Farm and Ranch magazine, or progressive farm or whatever he was working for, with a page showing how they were pumping water, well water in Texas, shallow wells. 
Uh, one of them was in Harlingen, Texas. The other one was in Cameron County, Texas. The other one was in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. And the fourth one was in New Mexico. So Texas had it made, and they were just about to get it made in New Mexico. But nobody knew that all of those wells were within a, a circle of a radius of two miles. So uh, anyhow, we had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, CPNL sent its employees to the workshops. Pete had it here, had them here. Uh, I guess once a year, and I heard about CPNL employees attending, a, going to school, you know, at a and m and sure enough, uh, finally they says, Otto, why don't you go to that school? I didn't feel that I needed to, but uh, if they wanted to offer me the opportunity, I'd take it. So I came up here with another ag engineer, Jim Ferguson, might have been uh, uh, a year or so ahead of me, and uh, we attended school here for six weeks, and uh, uh, I got back to the valley, and about two weeks later, why, here I get a letter from a and offering me a job. I said, gee whiz, it looks to me, you know, it looks like I was up at A&M not going to school. I was looking for a job. I can't take this thing. I turned it down, and I told him next time you offer me a job, why, start with the company president and let it trickle down that way. So about six months later, the employees started giving me strange looks, you know. I didn't know what was happening. And sure enough, one day, why, here I got a letter offering me a job, which I then took. That's when I came to A&M. So uh, they told me before I came, if you come to a and you've got a master's degree, you're going to have to get a PhD. So if you come, just plan on that. So that's what I did, and uh, eventually went up to Michigan State to do my master's work. And being up in Michigan State, I knew I was, had a job at A&M. What could I do up there that I could use in Texas as well? Finally turned out they had a bunch of foreign students there. They were working on rice. And I asked my major prof whether I could work on rice. He says, yeah, you can work on rice. So I proceeded to do that, worked for about uh, several months. And uh, when I was trying to glue that grain into a holder, it would crack. And the first reaction my major prof was, that glue is drying the rice grain out. And uh, after a couple of more weeks of work, I could take that rice grain and set it on a wet napkin, and that grain would fissure. And my major prof looked at me and says, Otto, forget everything you've done, you work on this. You work on this moisture absorption. So that's where I got off on moisture, Adsorption causes the rice grain to fissure. Well, for many years, the concept was that the grain fissures from uh, <clears throat> drying in the sun, drying in the sun, sun drying. Well, this work shows that that's not the case. It fissures because of moisture adsorption. And, uh, uh, the work did not coincide with what had been done, but uh, it turned out to be uh, true, turned out to be a truth, and so for the next, I guess, this year, it'll be some 50 years that I've been working with rice. And uh, during my entire career with A&M, why, uh, the papers that I wrote, they got worldwide distribution through ASAE. ASAE is our window to the world. 
we do something here that has applications throughout the world, ASAE is the window through which we do it. Uh, we get the information out to them, they get interested, and they come back and see us. So uh, I want to put in this plug for what is now ASABE. Uh, if we do something worthwhile here, uh, ASAE, ASABE will get it out to the world for us. Uh, it got to where uh, the folks around the world were waiting to see if I was on the program. And if I was on the program, they'd sit and watch the registration line. And uh, before I'd ever get registered, they'd be on my back saying, hey, I want to talk to you. So uh, I cannot uh, emphasize enough the help that ASAE, ASABE can be to people who are doing work that has applications around the world. Other people that worked in the EPNP area were uh, Romy Sorensen, spent, I guess, his entire career working in the area. And that person was his associate, uh, Bill McCune. They all did a lot of uh, very good work uh, uh, in the area, pneumatic conveying uh, and uh, such. Uh, I guess the federal government has come in from time to time to help. Uh, Romy had some work going on with uh, brain drying down in the Corpus Christi and Beaumont area. I guess during my career, I didn't just work on rice. I had people from the Sudan came here, wanted to work on cotton stalks. Gordon Tupper worked on uh, cotton seed. Uh, Bill Aldred worked on peach shakers. I worked on peach bruising, uh, peanut drying, uh, pretty well across the board. Just, I guess, the thing that fed the program that I was involved in was. Uh, the foreign students would pick up a paper, hear about a paper that I gave it, A-S-A-E, A-S-A-B-E, and that would bring them to the next meeting, and that would bring them to a and &M. So, uh, I think our time is about uh, up. Uh, my work has been on rice fishing. Uh, conventional wisdom was that cracking occurred when rice dried in the sun. Sun cracking is a term that's out. Uh, I had, uh, I was over in China and I had 64 students in my class. I gave them all some rice grains. I said, put them out at 6 o'clock in the evening after the birds quit flying and pick them up in the morning before the birds come out. and when you, they're all good grains that I'm giving you, and you see if they're still good in the morning. And 63 of them came back with fissured grains, and one of them said, mine didn't fissure. I said, why not? Well, I don't know. Well, when did you put them out? I put them out at 6 o'clock in the morning. When did you pick them up? 6 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> well, they weren't supposed to fissure, so uh, uh, the... Well, uh, it's the, the, the rice fishing was first uh, written about in about 1924. Uh, dean of Agriculture in the Philippines wrote about uh, the sun cracking of rice. And uh, 
that was published, circulated around the world, and the world grabbed it and hadn't turned loose. Uh, the fact that the grain fishers for moisture reabsorption uh, is not acceptable. <laughs> but what really happens is that the outside of the grain swells and it pulls the inside apart. When does it do this? At night, when the humidity is high, when the grain is adsorbing moisture. So uh, during my time with a &M, after the getting my PhD, I've never promoted the program, but uh, it's always been popular enough to where there have been foreign students that have come and they wanted to work on rice. So I hope that I can keep or uh, reinstate that program, and uh, uh, I think the Texas rice farmers are interested, and uh, uh, we'll see if we can't uh, do some more work with it. Well, what's the future? Uh, here, this, this slide simply shows highly fertilized rice on the right and uh, uh, lesser fertilized on the left. Uh, the two fish are about the same fertilization, doesn't make the difference. Whenever the highly fertilized rice uh, gets to the same uh, moisture content as the lesser fertilized rice, it has about the same number of fishes. Next. Next slide. Uh, this slide, the dotted line, shows uh, what the field sample might show you. This is the lowest moisture rice strain. This is the highest moisture rice strain. When you combine the rice here, this is what range of moistures you've got in it. Uh, these grains down in here are the ones that reabsorb moisture at night and fissure, uh, whereas these up here are too high in moisture. If you take enough of these and put a few of these in with it, you can make these fissure because these will give up enough moisture to cause them to fissure. Uh, this graph really shows a lot of information that we need to pursue further. Next. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, here you see uh, rice grains and a rosette. Uh, this is paper that has been punched out of a sheet of paper with a paper punch. And these are rice grains and a flashlight, a little flashlight under them uh, the rice grains uh, conduct the light. Here you can see a fissure right there. Uh, all of this, these are the same grains. Uh, this is uh, the first ones, uh, the first pictures, and 24 hours later you have this picture here. These are all the same grains. These are uh, fissures that came in after the rice was dried, simply because the moisture gradient from rapid drying, you get a moisture gradient in the grain. The moisture from the center moves out to the outside. The interior is losing moisture. The exterior is gaining moisture. The interior is contracting. The outside is expanding and you finally get the fissures that you see here. Next. <clears throat> okay, this work was recognized by the American Society of Agricultural Engineers as Outstanding Agricultural Engineering Achievement of the 20th Century. It's internationally recognized. Next. Uh, the problem has been we need to 
think right before we will do right. If we're not thinking right, if we're trying to make the grain crack during the day when it's actually cracking at night, we'll never solve the problem. So what do we have to do? The challenges of tomorrow. We need to improve battery technology. Recently, we had our windmill service, and I thought it took 15 minutes to get his belt and his tools and everything together, along with his little hand power tool. He got up there on the tower and tried to drill a hole in the battery dead on. <laughs> he took that drill and threw it just as far as he could. <laughs> and I didn't listen to what he said. Uh, we need to improve. Back in power, we need to use, enhance our use of solar energy. We're using it on electric fences and other particular applications, but it's a great improvement over charging the battery every week. We need to expand our use of wind energy. We see uh, trucks go by on 77 hauling one blade of a crop going down to South Texas somewhere. So we're getting some down in South Texas. And then when I go to see my doctor, he says, say, there's a young man who put up in a trailer house next to my house. He's a chemical engineering student, and he's going to figure out how or uh, why how we can develop uh, diesel fuel from algae. Well, that's vital energy. I think we're both agriculture and engineering. We need to get on the development of bioenergy. Energy. When do we need it? Well, tomorrow. And Eleanor Roosevelt told us when that is. Tomorrow is now. And with these <coughs> visions here, I think the best is yet to come. Thank you.